Last we left off, Constantine had just called together a council of Christian bishops from around the known world. They were to resolve all the challenges of the church so that he, Constantine, could get back to uniting the empire under Christianity. The council was set to tackle issues ranging from what day to celebrate Easter to how to heal the Miletian Schism, a sect like the Donatists who were concerned with the readmittance of lapsed priests into the church. This council was also going to formalize how the liturgy was given, provide rules for the structure of the church, and set down some guidelines for being a priest. No living in the houses of young women, no self-castration, no engaging in usury, you know, that sort of thing. But above all, they were there to deal with one thing, the Arian heresy. This was the main topic, the front and center issue that everybody had come to discuss. It was tearing apart the Christian world, and it was time it came to an end. So 318 bishops assembled in one late spring, 325 CE, in the coastal Anatolian town of Nicaea to settle this once and for all. The conference center was arrayed in splendor by the emperor. The bishops and all their aides and advisors were guests of the empire, housed, fed, and cared for at imperial expense. But more than that, the emperor himself would be in attendance. That's just how important this was to Constantine. Constantine set the tone for the meeting, walking in not surrounded by guards as was the norm for the person of the emperor, but rather entering surrounded only by a few friends. This wasn't a battle, it was a time to come together. And so it began. The debate was vigorous, using all the rhetorical art the Roman world was famous for. Laity and clerics both engaged in arguing the merits of each side, while the emperor sat there, gently reminding everyone that they were all Christians here, and that they needn't treat each other like enemies of the faith. And for weeks the discussions went on, contentious, impassioned, on at least one occasion breaking out into a brawl. But for all this, the truth was that most of the bishops were relatively moderate, looking to come to the correct answer, but believing that an answer could be found that both sides could agree to. And the emperor himself was happy to embrace anything that would just get all these guys to agree. So the discussions really resolved down to the points of view of two men. Arius, the namesake of Arianism, whose unbending views had caused the council to be summoned in the first place, and a man named Athanasius. Athanasius was a deacon of Alexandria, where the whole Arian schism began. He was an ardent anti-Arian, and he intended to do everything in his power to make sure that no compromise with the Arians was reached. And so time rolled forward with the council split, no overwhelming majority willing to come down on either side. Debate continued on how to achieve a compromise position, but the discussion wound in circles as these two men, Athanasius and Arius, dominated the discussion and kept any chance of truly finding a middle ground at bay. Still, time and again, the emperor reminded them all that they were here to heal the church, that as Romans and as Christians, they were more alike than different, and that they should be able to find a way to work such esoteric theological differences out. But Constantine, powerful, intelligent, and adroit as he was, was not the type of subtle theologian that Athanasius turned out to be. Because as the debate moved on, Athanasius began to introduce the term homoousian into the discussion. And this was a throw of the dice, because homoousian means of the same substance, which made many of the bishops a little uneasy, as it had been used in other heretical contexts before to claim that there was no difference between God the Son and God the Father. But Athanasius knew that this was a term that Arius had objected to in the past, and that he would never agree to any compromise that involved using the term homoousian. So Athanasius started to appear to be the reasonable one. He could look as if he were slightly willing to bend, knowing that no compromise he ever offered would be accepted so long as it could be worded talking about Christ as homoousian. And here's where the debate really began to get rowdy, because now people had to polarize. You had to agree with this term or not, as no one was going to compromise around it. There was one last attempt at bringing everyone together, though, trying to get people to meet in the middle and say that Christ was homoousian, or of similar nature to God. But by now, this was thoroughly rejected by all those who had declared themselves firmly on one side or another. And even as this compromise was being discussed, Athanasius was secretly pulling people over to his side. While the great debate was happening in public, the anti-Aryan faction was making deals and persuading people in private. Slowly, bishop by bishop, they assembled a majority coalition. And soon, that majority was threatening damnation and excommunication for anybody who followed the heretical Aryan formulation. And so, those less firm in their Aryan beliefs began to switch sides as well. Not wanting to risk their immortal souls, or perhaps their positions in the church, almost every delegate signed on to the homoousian idea of Christ. Only Arius himself, one deacon, and two other bishops refused to sign what would become known as the Nicene Creed, cementing the Trinitarian view of Christ. And thus, Arianism was declared heresy, its teachings anathema, and its preaching an exilable offense. And so the emperor got up, dusted off his clemis, and thought to himself, job well done. 
I mean, after all, he had brought all the priests together. They had basically all agreed on something, and he could now exile those few who had disagreed, unity would be restored, and he could get back to ruling the empire. But it's not quite that simple, because a few months later, Constantine found he also had to exile a man named Eusebius, a prelate who had signed the creed but who continued to refuse to condemn Arius. This may seem like a small thing, one man being exiled over taking a half-hearted stand not condemning his friend, but Eusebius was actually a distant relative of Constantine's, and unlike Arius, who was principally known in Egypt and the ecclesiastical circles of the East, Eusebius was a member of Constantine's court. In fact, that's why he had to exile him, because he kept pushing for Arius in Constantine's inner circle long after Constantine was good and done with this whole heresy thing. But Constantine's sister liked Eusebius, and soon he was recalled from exile. But if there was any doubt which side Eusebius was on, his exile cemented him as a firm Arian. And so he worked at court day by day to soften the emperor's views on Arianism. And, as even exiling its principal supporters and declaring the belief heretical hadn't actually stamped out the Arian beliefs, Constantine began to be receptive to the idea of a softer rapprochement than he had previously been, a kind of coexistence. After all, he wanted harmony in his empire. But harmony was not on Eusebius's mind. He schemed against Athanasius, never publicly putting himself in opposition to him, but getting other groups to accuse Athanasius of a myriad of crimes. At last, through a rigged trial, he was able to get Athanasius convicted, and he convinced the emperor that it was actually Athanasius who was now preventing the rift in the Christian church to heal, with his die-hard refusal to readmit schismatics into the church, and that he should be exiled. Meanwhile, Eusebius had also succeeded in getting Arius recalled. So with Athanasius exiled and Arius recalled, the Arian doctrine began to gain strength in the empire again. Constantine himself would, at the very end of his life, be baptized by Eusebius. And his son? His son would be a die-hard Arian throughout his rule. And though after hundreds of years the Nicene Creed would eventually win out, this reprieve for Arianism allowed it to spread and slip out of the empire. For Eusebius ordained a Goth named Ulfilus to go on a mission to the Gothic tribes, and he was successful, converting many and cementing Arian Christianity as the Christianity of the Northern tribes. And this is one of the reasons that the Gothic tribes never really integrated into the Roman Empire. It's one of the reasons that rather than become assimilated like so many other groups, they remained separate, integral to the empire but never really being part of it. And in the end, it's part of why they tore the empire apart. Join us next time as we jump a few hundred years ahead for the Monophysite heresy, which plagued Justinian and destroyed the unity of Eastern Rome.